وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين لا سيما بقية الله روحي وأرواح العالمين لتراب مقدمه الفداء بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وأحل عقدة من لساني يفقه قولي قول الله في محكم كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم واجتنبوا قول الزور First of all, I will give you in honor of the greatest man to walk this earth, Al-Habib Al-Mustafa Muhammad. The second in honor of the greatest lady to walk this earth, Al-Hawra Al-Batulati Fatima. And the third with your loudest voices in, our, in honor of our Imam, Imam Sahib Al-Asri wa zaman Allah. The verse in question seeks to discuss a very vital aspect in the Western society and a very vital aspect that we can relate to nowadays, even in the countries that we were brought up and our backgrounds. And the topic for tonight is Insha'Allah, we will be discussing, which will be very infiltrative of the concept of music. First and foremost, many people have asked the question and have requested that we talk more about the aspect of music. Because on a 21st century level, we know that our fathers and our forefathers have told us, you know what, music is haram. Music is unacceptable in Islam. However, we haven't heard many lectures about why music is haram. What is the jurisprudence be behind the fact that music may be unacceptable within the school of thought of Ahlul Bayt and indeed the Islamic principles? So inshallah tonight we'll be looking at particular aspects in which we'll be able to look at why music is haram through jurisprudential arguments, through the Quran and through the ahadith. First we'll be discussing how it's taking a large part of our lives and the Western culture, how it's infiltrated many aspects in which we live in, whether it be work, whether it be universities, whether it be study, even primary school and so much so to go even further and say even before that, people are always acquainted with the aspect of music. Every time they open the TV, there may be something that's not necessarily PG. And that person doesn't have a particular age that we can say that, you know what, this is PG. When he opens the TV, he sees what he sees. And that's imprinted into him. And that's why we have to look at during the lecture tonight, inshallah, how that has a effect on the youth, how that has an effect on us as adults, and how that may be effective of our belief. Someone may be questioning, yes, we understand that it's haram, but how can it have an effect of how you may think, your aqeedah, your particular inclination towards one person, whether it be rightly guided or not. And that's all we discussed tonight, insha'Allah, the effect of music in all these particular parameters. But before we start, insha'Allah, request a loud salawat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. When we open the TV nowadays, amongst the many things that are being looked at to be very famous, very trendy, things that you may be discussing at schools, at universities and in the workforce, are particular shows of popularity, namely to do with obviously the topic of music, namely, especially in the Australian society, stuff such as the X Factor, in which people come forth and produce, let's say, arts that they have mastered over the years, whether it be instrumental or vocal, and they either are embarrassed by saying that you're not very good, or if they are good, they'll go on to the next stage, eventually going up for the title. Other shows such as The Voice, such as Australian has talent, Australians got talent. So these shows we find that are very popular within our Western culture. However, they've actually formed a very large portion of the lives of Muslims. And it's sad to say that many of our Muslim brothers and sisters do accompany these ideologies within their daily lives, watching the shows, learning from the shows, and having a lot of pleasure when watching these particular shows and listening to particular sounds or vocals or music in that sense. Now, 
Someone may come forth and ask the question, and it's very familiar. Why is it that mu music is haram in Islam? What are the main factors that make it haram? Where in the Quran does it say that music is haram? The first of which I want to look at, before we discuss the Islamic principles to do with music. First and foremost, I want to look at a particular doctor. We find that the sad thing is, when we bring forth Quran, to the normal person, even a Muslim, when we tell them this is the hadith, he says, I want more proof, as to say that it's not enough proof from the Quran, the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the person that created everything, and the hand-picked messengers and the imams that Allah has hand-chosen. They say, no, that's not enough. Give me more. So I start off by saying, first and foremost, let's look at a doctor. And this doctor was a professor in Columbia University. And he had a study to do with how music or the famous music cliffs may have an effect on the human body. Is it a positive effect? Is it a negative effect? What exactly is this effect? So he says, after my research, my lengthy research, I have deciphered that music, especially the popular music nowadays, and he refers to particular two particular aspects or genres of music, one of which being the aspect that they call the genre such as hip hop, and the other known as R&B, otherwise known as rhythms and blues. He says these particular genres of popularity have such a significant aspect of deteriorating the human body that the nervous system will go onto a state where it will be deteriorating. He says, well, I've even discussed this with the senators of the time. He says people actually wanted to vote against having music to the general public because it has such a negative effect on the human body and the deteriorating of their nervous system. That's number one. If that's not enough proof that music may be haram because it has a negative impact on your body, let's move on towards the Islamic principles that teach us why music is haram. Why is it that it may be affecting my life without even knowing it? How does it subconsciously find its path within my thought process and what I lean towards and who I hold on to and who I let go of? We look at a particular principle which is from the fourth Imam. Imam Ali ibn al Hussein, which he writes a treatise of rights. 50 rights in a book and arguably the best rights you will ever read. He gives everything a right in that book, starting from Allah. Every single aspect in your lives. Your hands, your tongue, your ears, your sight, your stomach, your feet, your companions, your mother, your father. Fifty rights he named in that book. And he teaches us what Islam says about each and every right and how it has a right on us. And he mentions in reference to the aspect of music, he says, even your E has a right over you. What is that right? He says, the right of your E over you is that you know for a fact that your E is a gateway to your heart. Now listen carefully to this one. He says, your E is a direct pathway to your heart. So whatever you hear, especially at a young age, will be instilled and cultivated in your heart. Then he says, it's your right to ensure that only that which is noble enters your heart. And anything that's ignoble should not find its way in that particular path to your heart. When Ali ibn Abi Talib teaches us, and he tells his son, Imam Hassan, he says, I tried to cultivate your heart before it heartened. I want to cultivate your heart, he says to him. Before it hardens, at an older age, it begins to harden and harden. Once the trials and tribulations have come forth, once you've already made up your character, it's hard to teach someone something new after he's already made up his character. Yeah, that's why Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib says, I tried to cultivate your heart at a young age. Imam Zain al-Abidin teaches us this when he sees the right of the E. He says, it's a direct path to your heart. If you listen towards that which is ignoble, that which doesn't necessarily have the best language, doesn't necessarily teach us the best morality, 
Stuff that the, the Ahlul Bayt would look down upon. Stuff that when you listen and you cultivate your heart, Imam Sahib al Asri al Zaman would look down upon. Imam says, it has a right over you, this ear that you hear with. When you listen to backbiting, your heart craves towards that. When you listen towards that which is pure, your heart will levitate towards that. When you listen towards Quran, your heart will crave Quran. When you listen to the words of Ahlul Bayt, your heart will crave the words of Ahlul Bayt. When you listen to the tragedy of Imam Hussein, your heart pulsates towards that. But when you listen to music, instilling in the fact that it teaches within its particular rhymes and rhythms, not the most noble of characters, not the most noble of teachings, that cultivates your heart, that finds its path towards your heart, and that's how your heart will pulsate. That's what's content within your heart. And that's why when the Alama writes a book, the Staghaybi Shirazi, he writes a book instilling 50 of the greatest sins. People come and I say, it's in that particular book. Listening to music is in that book. And would you believe it? He, he ranks each and every particular sin in order of the greatest sin and he moves downwards. Do you know which one is music? Number 15 in that book, he writes as music, one of the greatest sins. Music. Why? He says, we have a hadith, and we'll get to them very shortly, of how it may affect us, our lives. The verse in question which we stated, when the Holy Quran states to us, in Surah Al-Hajj, chapter 22, ayah 30, it says, do not, and beware, make sure you move from Qawl al-Zur. What's Qawl al-Zur? It says, What does that mean? Make sure you remove yourself from that particular Qawl. What is that? When you look at the hadith, Imam al-Sadiq first and foremost says to us, Qawl al-Zur, and many other traditions, says Qawl al-Zur refers to the words of the, of the musicians. Number one. The words of the musicians in the Quran, yes. It says, make sure you stay away from that word. Make sure you stay away from music. Why? Why do you stay away? In other narrations, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi wa Wasallam states, he says, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala has brought me as a mercy to mankind. And part and partial of that mercy is that I came to eradicate the idea of music being part and parcel of your lives. The Prophet of Islam. وَمَا يَنْطَقُ عَنِ الْهَوَىٰ إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا وَحْيٌ يُحَىٰ Doesn't speak of his own accord. Therefore, when we find that people come forth and say that music, why is it haram? Let me listen to this. It doesn't affect me in any negative manner. Ali ibn Abi Talib states, he says, know very well that any household that has music in it, or plays music in it. What's the effect? He says, make sure and know very, very certainly that no angels will come around that household. And he says, do not be surprised if your prayers, look at the, look at the particular calamity which is playing music in your households. He says, don't be surprised if you pray, your prayers are not accepted because if you have music playing, some people come and say, well, it's just a small sin. The Staghaybi Shirazi puts us at the 15, 15th most or the 15th greatest sin that you may commit. Imam Zain al-Abidin has a beautiful statement. Beautiful statement. If we apply just that statement in our lives, look how much we will change. He says, never look at the size of the sin. Someone says, I'm, I'm listening to this particular music, this particular Genre, it may not be vulgar mannerisms, ignoble words, and it's instilling within our hearts because it makes itself in our pathway. Imam says, do not look at the size of the sin. 
rather than la, rather look at who you're sinning against, which is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And on the positive side, when he says when you do a good deed, don't look at the size of it, look at who's judging that particular good deed. When we move on, and we have a very beautiful story in reference to Imam al-Kadhim. And it's a very famous story, but we don't look at it in the depth that we should. He goes past the house. This house has music in it, playing. And when he hears the music, there was a servant that comes outside to throw the trash. As she's about to throw the trash, Imam al-Kadhim asks her a question. He says, what is it? He says, is the owner of this house a slave or a free man? Which one is it? He says, he's, he's of the aristocrats. Of course he's a free man. So the imam nods. He says, you're correct. If he was a slave, he would not do that which he is doing. So she thinks, strange. And the imam walks off. She comes back. A person by the name of Bishr looks at her. And says, why did you take so long to throw the trash out? She says, I had a meeting, or I collided an acquaintance with a man outside. He says, what did he say to you? He said, he asked me about you. He says, what did he ask you about me? He says, is your master a free man or a slave? And what did you reply? He says, I replied by saying, obviously he's a free man. You're of the aristocrats. He says, what did he say? He says, you're right. He said, if your master was a slave, he would not do that which he is doing. So Bishr asks that servant, he says, what did the man look like? So she begins to tell him the characteristics physically of Imam al kadhim in which Bishr drops everything that he's doing on the floor and he runs outside. The narration said he didn't even have a chance to put on his sandals. That's why he's known as Bishr al-Hafi. Why? Hafi means he doesn't wear, isn't it? Any sandals or any footwear. If we wanted to look at it in our context. Runs outside barefoot, looking for the Imam. When he finds him, he throws himself. A narration says at his feet. Other narrations say at, and on his lap. When he throws himself... On the Imam, he begins to ask or seek forgiveness. He says, oh Imam, I know I have done wrong. Straight away, what did the Imam say? Two words, is he a free man or a slave? Us, we listen and listen and listen. Year in, year out, we hear the call of Imam Hussein. But how many of us follow what he teaches us? Be sure one word, he ran towards the Imam of his time. How many of us are running away from the Imam of our time by the actions that we're committing? Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, he says this. He says, be sure and do not be surprised that if a music or if music is played in your house, that the angels will not come. Furthermore, your prayers may not be accepted. Look at the position and the greatness of such a sin. Imam Rida alayhi afdala salati was salam once the ma'moon spreads a rumor. He said the Imam believes that music isn't haram. So when the rumor comes towards Imam Rida, he begins to ask the question, where did you get this rumor from? He says, well, you've never said anything about music. People play it openly. And Imam Rida comes to him and he says, I want to ask you a question. And this is the question each and every individual should ask themselves. Imam Rida begins to question that person. He says, let me ask you, if you had a balance and you were in charge of that balance, each and every one of us in ourselves, if we had a balance, one balance is heaven, goodness, purity, and the other balance is hellfire, impurity. He says, where would you put music? Which side of the balance? So the man straight away, he replies. He says, I would put it in the side of hellfire. The side of impurity. He says, therefore, even in yourself, without asking, you know that this may be a wrong act. Why is it that you have to question it time and time again? 
And the problem with our society is what? Is when particular acts in religion are acceptable by us, we take it. It fits into our roster. It fits into our daily routine. It fits in with our cultural perspectives. But when Islam comes in a clash with our cultural perspectives, the Western influence, we put it aside. When a wedding comes, people go as far as to say, if I don't have music in my wedding, I'm not getting married altogether. And the problem starts. Why? About a particular act of haram. Let's put it onto ourselves. How may this affect our religion? And when I say our religion, I mean the religion that we instill when we follow Ali ibn Abi Talib and pride ourselves in saying we are the followers of Ali ibn Abi Talib. How can music have an effect on us? Now, everything I've said may be a little bit dry. We have to get our head across the Quranic verses, the ahadith, and there's many, many more, but I'm trying to restrain myself within the time. Commitments. When the Quran in other verses, when we look at chapter 23, verse 1, 2, and 3, and it states to us about the mu'minun, it says, Victorious are the believers, which believers? The people that are or have concentration in prayers. Which ones? It says when they hear music or words of music, they stay away. Another one. And there's many more to come. But the one I want to look at tonight before I end, and the gist of it, the importance that we can apply to our lives now, when Imam Sadiq says ever so beautifully in Bihar al-Anwar, he says that listening to music, what's its effect? And one of the greatest effects in a negative manner on us, the followers of Ahl al-Bayt. In Bihar al-Anwar he states, he says, it listening to music, promotes the growth of hypocrisy. How does it promote it? It says it promotes it in such a way that water promotes growth within vegetation. Imagine that. Listening to music promotes hypocrisy in a manner of which water promotes growth in vegetation. I just want you to envision this. Some of you may be asking, why is hypocrisy such a big thing? Why is the Sayyid saying that this may affect us, the school of thought of Ahl al-Bayt? Why? Because we need to join the dots when we have a hadith. Yes, it promotes hypocrisy. Why is it a danger? When we have the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says in reference to Ali ibn Abi Talib, he says about Ali a statement which we will know from tonight that we will try our best to stay away from hypocrisy and music. What's the statement? Oh Ali, only a believer loves you and the only one that hates you or has hatred towards you is a what? A hypocrite. The one that has hatred towards you is a hypocrite. When we listen towards music and Imam Sadiq says that it promotes the growth of hypocrisy. What does that mean for us the followers of Ahl al-Bayt? The Quran states there cannot be two hearts in one body. We can't say we listen to music but we love Ali ibn Abi Talib. When Ali comes with all these statements against music, we love Imam Ali. We love Ahl al-Bayt, but we're not going to take their teachings. Hypocrisy. That's its effect when listening to music. One of the effects of hypocrisy, and if not the greatest one. And that's why we've overlooked it time and time again. Overlooked this particular aspect, seeing that it may be a small sin, when in actual fact, it may be one of the greatest. Why? Abu Fadl al-Abbas, which we'll be discussing on the seventh night, and especially in reference to the speech that he had. When Imam Hussein was chased from one place to another, Imam 
Hussein was driven out of Mecca, Abu Fadl al-Abbas stands on the top of the Kaaba. What does he say? In his speech, he reminds us the position of Imam Hussein and the position of Yazid, the enemy of Imam Hussein. He mentions many things, inshallah, we'll get to that in the upcoming nights. One of which, and the most important to our topic tonight, he says, no, and remember, in whose house or in whose palaces music is being played and dancers are dancing, and in whose houses the revelation of the Holy Quran came. That in its fact should tell us, brothers and sisters, that in the time of Imam Hussein, when we try to differentiate ourselves every day, is Ashura and every land is Karbala. What does that mean? It means Karbala is happening every single day. How? When we put ourselves in the balance, whether we'd be on the side of Imam Hussein or on the opposition, look at it nowadays. Do we do things that the Imams would love or hate? On the 10th of Muharram, when Imam Hussein comes and he asks the question, what's the question? He says, why is it that you fight me? Is it because of a sunnah that I have changed? Is it a particular thing that I have done in hatred towards you? Have I done injustice? Look at the reply to tell you. That we need to stay away from music and come back towards the school of thought of Ahlul Bayt. The reply that came from the opposition army, we have nothing to do with you. Then what? He says, we fight you. Isn't it? In hatred to your father. Who? Amir al-Mu'mineen. Who was Amir al-Mu'mineen? When the Prophet of Islam says, Ali ibn Abi Talib, if he takes one valley, and the entire world takes another valley. Follow Ali ibn Abi Talib into that valley. He says about Ali ibn Abi Talib that he is with the truth and the truth is with him. When the person comes to him after Jamal and Imam asks him, which side were you on? He says, well, it was very unclear for me. He says, why? He says, on one side, I saw particular personalities that were known to be prestigious at the time of the Prophet. And on the other side, which is your army, O Ali ibn Abi Talib, I also saw prestigious figures. I was very confused. Look at the reply of Ali ibn Abi Talib. And it's a lesson to be learned. Ali ibn Abi Talib says, look and seek the truth. Once you seek the truth, you will know its people. Look at that valuable statement that we need to apply to our lives. Ali ibn Abi Talib, which the Prophet says about, look at the rank of Ali. Inshallah on the 10th night, we want to look at the ranks in the eyes of Allah, of our Imams, especially Imam Sahib al-Asri was zaman when the Prophet of Islam says about him, he says, what do I say about Ali ibn Abi Talib? He says about him, he says, Lawla, if I was not afraid, Lawla, an akhaf an taqula fika ta'ifatun min ummati. If I was not afraid that a portion of my ummah will say about you what the Christians said about Jesus, son of Mary. Says, I would have said a statement about you that people will take from the dust of your feet and your ablution that which will they find blessing in. He says, but what is sufficed? He says, Hasbuk. Says, we want to pray to Allah, inshallah, on this note. Knowing very well the effect that music may have on us. We want to pray to Allah on this holy night. Why? Because Imam Hussein is the largest ship that you can get on. And repentance is the largest door that you can enter towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I speak to myself first and foremost. And I pray to Allah and we all pray to Allah that he may instill us and make our feet firm on the right path. 
the path of Ahlul Bayt, and inshallah, we can take from their teachings and apply, and don't go against them in any manner, and only do that which pleases them in every manner. And want to pray to Allah that He may grant us this from this night and moving forward. With barakat al salat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Oh! <laughs>